in a sense, the revolution that began in Paris in 1789 never really ended. The uprising of the population against its rulers, which overthrew feudalism and absolutism, produced the Declaration of the Rights of Man that same year, and then proclaimed a republic in 1792, failed to achieve its stated goal of liberty, fraternity, and equality. The Constitution of 1793, passed overwhelmingly by popular vote, universal male suffrage, was never implemented. In 1794, in the wake of the terror, the army besieged and defeated the saint and the Faubourg Saint Antoine, summarily terminating any hope of a classless society. The following year, the Directoire replaced universal male suffrage with a vote based on property, handed the economy over to speculators, brought back the monarchists, and paved the way for Napoleon Bonaparte. And after Napoleon's defeat, the Bourbons immediately came back, first the feeble Louis XVIII, then the vile Charles X. Nevertheless, the Parisian population would not fold its cards the Parisians have historically shown an extraordinary willingness and even eagerness to fight authority in the streets. The first half of the 19th century in particular can seem like a continuous blur of riots and skirmishes and full-scale insurrections, ranging from the strictly local and obscurely motivated to the world historical and reverberating. Even today, when the city is generally far outside the means of even the middle class, and its social problems have exported have been exported to the Banlieu and the provinces, it continues to serve as a theater for every sort of demonstration and strike on a regular basis, often to the exasperation of visitors from more placid or repressed societies. Frederick Engels sounded like a particularly appreciative 19th century tourist when he wrote that the Parisians, quote, join as no other people have done, a passion for enjoying life with a passion for taking historical action, end quote. A century later, Walter Benjamin speculated that, quote, Paris is a counterpart in the social order to what Vesuvius is in the natural order, a menacing, hazardous, massive, an ever active hotbed of revolution. But just as the slopes of Vesuvius, thanks to the layers of lava that cover them, have been transported into the baritisal orchards, so the lava of revolutions provides uniquely fertile ground for the blossoming of art, festivity, fashion. The decades that passed between the demise of Napoleon Bonaparte's empire in 1814-15 and the coup d'etat undertaken by his nephew, Napoleon III, in 1851, are a confusing welter of incidents that account for nearly every year of that span. What they had in common is that they were all directed against authority, generally royal authority, although they took many different forms. There were riots by liberals, and there were riots by students defending professors who had been expelled from their chairs because of their liberalism. There were anti-clerical riots. The church, after all, was the first of the state, above even the nobility in its power. There were riots by Bonapartists, including, in 1822, the brief uprising that resulted in the execution of the four sergeants of La Rochelle, once famous, once so famous, that cafes were named in their memory. The sergeants were Carbonari, members of a Masonic secret society that exerted enormous influence throughout Europe, notably in the reunification of Italy. The Carbonari, the name derives from its original function as a guild of charcoal makers, in turn inspired a great number of secret societies with diverse goals, such as the later revolutionary cabals, the Society of the Seasons, the Society of Families, the Society of Avengers. The first of these attempted its own insurrection in 1839, out of the blue, which failed because its potential allies were caught unprepared. 
all three societies were active in the thwarted revolution of 1848. Secret societies, in, in any case, held a cloak and dagger appeal that covered the political spectrum. In his History of the Thirteen, 1833, Balzac, who was fascinated by occult fraternities and attempted without much success to found a secret lodge of writers, laid out the seductive promise of the ring. In Paris, under the empire, 13 men came together who were equally possessed by the same idea, all of them endowed with sufficient energy to be faithful to the same principles, sufficiently honest with one another not to betray the cause even when their individual interests conflicted, so deeply prudent as to keep hidden the sacred bonds that linked them, strong enough to position themselves above all laws, tough enough to undertake all that was required, and so lucky that they almost always succeeded in their schemes. They had run great risks, but veiled their defeats. They were impervious to fear and had never trembled in the presence of the prince, nor of the executioner, nor of innocence itself. They accepted one another for what they were, despite social prejudices. They were undoubtedly criminals, but they also displayed some of the qualities that mark men as great. They only recruited among the elite. Nothing is lacking in the dark and mysterious poetry of this story. These 13 men remained unknown. For all that each of them had realized, the most bizarre ideas that imagination might conjure based on the fantastic powers falsely ascribed to a Manfred, a Faust, a Melma, and today all of them are broken, or at least dispersed.